<laughs> and wood ones, which are highly yes. collectible. These um, can be found now for about five pounds each. So you, you've got quite a lot here already. Yes. And then we have another layer down. More of those. Right, we've got on. some more with names on. We've got one I particularly like, which says, marry me quick and love me forever. Yes. That is one of the finest ones. I yes. think that's very amusing and that yes. can be worth 50 pounds on its own. I don't know how much you paid for it. Probably paid half a crown for it in John Bly's father's shop. <laughs> oh, I wonder if he's listening. John Bly? Yes. Oh, used to get, fantastic. when I collected enough money, I'd trip down on the bus and see what he got available. Fantastic. These bobbins on this pillow are probably worth three to four hundred. And what we've seen here will add up to about a thousand pounds. Good gracious. <laughs> All for my twelve and six. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, here we've got a fine run of three English shotguns by the great English maker Wesley Richards, who are still going at this moment in yeah. Birmingham. This is a converted pinfire gun, yeah. which started out life with a French design cartridge, which had a little pin which stuck out the top, yeah. and it would originally have come out of the top of the locks there. And if you look there, there's just a tiny little bit of infill oh, yes. in that, yes. and then converted it subsequently to a centre fire yeah. cartridge, mm. which is to all intents and purposes the same as we use today. Right. We move on to this other one. This is uh, very much the same principle, but was actually built as a centre fire. Yeah. But this differs from this earlier one in that it's got a safety feature fitted into it, yeah. in that you can't actually make the hammer fall on the striker properly unless you've pulled the trigger. Right. Right. It's known as a rebounding lock. Right. And that was very important because if you've got cold hands and you're trying to cock it, yeah. and your finger or thumb slipped on it right. and it went off before you were quite ready, then it might have been... Uh, quite any improvement. Yes. Mm. And then pushing on to this one, which is perhaps, I think, the most important of the three. Think so? Yes. Mm. The simple fact that it's the Anson and Dealey patent action. box lock yeah. action that's mm. still employed today. It's called a box lock for the simple fact that the action actually looks like a box. All that's happened, really, is for the mechanism in there has been compressed and put into this piece of steel. You can date these quite accurately from yeah. the fact that this one was a pinfire gun, which we'll put it sometime before 1870. Yeah. This one, about 1875 to 1880. And this one, certainly before 1885. This is not in the best of condition. It's um, no, it lost a lot of the checkering off there. Right, yeah. But certainly for, from its interest point of view, yeah. and there is a tremendous amount of interest being generated by early shotguns, yeah. far, far more than it was 10 years ago. Mm. You couldn't give them away 10 years no, ago. No. So this somewhere 300, 400 pounds. Yeah. This one round about five, five and a half. Yeah. And this one, because it's got the Wesley Richards gold name there, That's which right. adds yeah. to it yeah. somewhere Five to eight hundred, something like that. Hmm. So, um, talking about thirteen, fourteen, fifteen hundred pounds, something like that. Something like that, yeah. Do you ever use it? I don't, to be quite honest. Uh, my parents are actually looking after it at the moment for me. You know, it's Burmese glass, yeah. which was first produced in the Mount Washington Glass Works in the United States in 1886. Really, nobody's quite sure why it was called Burmese because uh, it was supposed to have been, the formula for it was supposed to have been discovered by a Burmese glass worker. And then it was made under licence by Thomas Webb in Stourbridge, who called it Queen's Patent Burmese Ware because Queen Victoria was very keen on it. She had services of it. I'm almost certain this is Thomas Webb. And it's so unusual to have such a large one, you know, with these little vases, and, and it seems to be in perfect condition. But this is what I haven't seen very often before. These would hold night lights that you put in and, of course, glowed through here. But usually they are just glass. But these are made entirely in the Burmese glass, and they've got Clark's patent trademark fairy-like written inside them, which is, you know, absolutely stunning. 
Uh, you know, of course, that the, it has uranium in it, the glass, yeah, gold so. and uranium. And that's what causes it. When it's reheated at the furnace, the pale yellow shades through to quite a deep pink as it's reheated. The other thing is that if you put a Geiger counter near it, it will go mad because of the uranium in it. But I, I mean, it's not dangerous. You didn't worry about it. <laughs> but how did you get it? I've inherited it from my uh, grandma. You're very, uh, very lucky. You got it insured? Um, my parents have actually dealt with that for me, insured How it much? Me. Uh, as far as I know, approximately 900, I'm, I'm not 100% I'd sure. I'd up that a bit. Yeah. I'd up it to about 1,500 now. Another one. It's another one. How much is this doggy? I'm doing no more dogs today. <laughs> the end. <laughs> but for forty-five pounds, you had a very, very good buy. I can tell you because that ring today, if it came up for auction, would make somewhere in the region about three hundred and fifty to four hundred and fifty pounds. So good buy at the time. What about this one? Um, that I bought in 1978, I paid £1.50 for it. £1.50? Mm. What, with the chain? No, not the chain. No. Oh, what a pity you didn't get the chain as well. <laughs> £1.50. Right, well, that is actually mid-Victorian. Yeah. That actually would date from around about 1860 or 1870, that sort of period. Uh, it's got a foiled amethyst in the centre, and it's set with diamonds on the top, and nicely enamelled around the outside edge. Uh, very popular uh, from the archaeological finds and so at that yeah. time. Now you've got the locket back. It's actually gold. I don't know if you realise that for £1.50. Uh, a locket like that would make today, I would have thought, around about eight to £1,200. So would you mind telling me where you bought it? On Blackburn Road. And is the shop still there? No, it's gone. <laughs> oh, what a pity, because I'd love to go around there. <laughs> Well, it would have been uh, extraordinary, I suppose, to have come all the way to Lancashire and not seen a pair of Lancashire clogs. Yes, um, yes. Were these, were these yeah. ones upon a time yours? Did you ever wear these? No, they belonged to mother. To your mother? Yes. And she remembers using these. Did you ever use clogs when you were a girl? I, I wore clogs, yes. Did you? I when worked, you were a young girl? Um, I worked in the mill and wore clogs. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. It's very, I mean, it's yeah. almost um, yeah. difficult to imagine what it was like yeah. wearing them. Yeah. I mean, they look as if they were yeah. very uncomfortable, were they? Mm -hmm. No, no, they were the, the most comfortable footwear that you can get. Were they really? Especially when you were doing a lot of standing yes. and walking and, uh, yes. And one imagines, because of the way they're made, they quite literally, and this is proof of it, lasted a lifetime. Yes, yeah, yeah, with tender loving care, yes. <laughs> tender loving care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're obviously too young to have won this magnificent prize. Yes. How did you get it? Well, it was passed to me by my mother, who um, received it as a gift from a neighbour about 40 years ago, 35 years ago. So we don't know who it was awarded to? No. Ah, well, I used I... to pretend it was me. Ah, well. <laughs> anyway, but what we do know is who made the pot. Right. The pot was made in Birkenhead yeah. at the Della Robbia factory by Charles Walker. And there we uh, have Della Robbia, Charles Walker, and in fact the date 1904. So obviously it was ordered for this extremely brilliant student. And it'd be fascinating to know who it was. And um, I still think it's probably worth more than £2,000. <laughs> I better not hit it with the hoover anymore, No, no, then. <laughs> no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. No, not good for the hoover, you know. No. So here we have a cabinet which, to all intents and purposes, is Chippendale. All the details look Chippendale. The first thing I would say is the size of it makes me suspicious about the date. I would expect an 18th century piece to be a bit bigger. So let's actually look at the details and see if we can find out what date it is. This lovely Chinese Chippendale pagoda cresting up here is absolutely typical of his work. But these cornices, and this should come off quite easily, were made, surprisingly, in the 18th century, in the 1750s and 60s, they would be made in, in, in three-piece plywood. Now, you'd expect plywood to be a modern thing, but here you can see it's in the solid. And if that had been made by Chippendale or his contemporaries in the 1750s or 60s, 
I'd expect to see one, two, three pieces of plywood, each piece going another way. So if I can use my fingers as an illustration, we've got the grain going one way on one, another way on another, yeah. another way on another, yeah. which builds up a lamination and makes it much stronger. Here we've got it cut out of the solid, which is not the 18th century way of doing it. Chippendale or his contemporaries would not have used painted decoration like this. It was a very unlikely. Mahogany ground, which was a very common wood in the 1750s, but not to have this sort of painting. When you look inside, you can see it's one sheet of glass. Now, again, in the 18th century, there always would have been however many panes Separate of glass, pieces. 13 or 7 in this case, or whatever, individual pieces of glass putted in. It's a typical 18th century piece. Of course, it could have been replaced and broken, but it's unlikely, because the astrographs are perfectly original. Um, and the drawers, no doubt, here will tell us even more. Again, one of the first rules about furniture, it's a general rule, but it normally works, you never get this quarter moulding until about 1800. But in fact, this is even later than that. The first revival of the Chippendale style was in about the 1830s or 40s, and then again in the 1890s and 1900, but also in the interwar period. Yeah. How long have you had this piece of furniture? 12 years. Right. Well, it's older than that, but it's not a lot older than that. I mean, it could actually be just before the Second World War or even just after the Second World War. Yeah. So it's not really an antique piece of furniture, but it's a nicely made piece of furniture, made in a good quality factory, and they probably made 10, 20, even 30 or 40 of these when they made them. Yeah. You'll never find another one. I'll probably never see another one in my career. But it's a nicely made, good quality cabinet. I'm sure that will keep appreciating in value. Now, I'm sticking my neck out here because you bought it 12 years ago, which is comparatively recently. How much, did, may I ask you how much you paid for it? 1,200 pounds. 1,200, from an antique shop or? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I would say that this is worth Certainly for insurance, i.e. from a dealer, it will cost you £2,500. Yeah. So it's doubled in 12 years, yeah. yet it's not even 50 years old. Correct. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Now, tell me about these. Uh, they are vases that my mother-in-law bought in a sale. I've oh. no idea how much she paid for them. And when was this? It would have been in the 30s. No Do you time. know what these are? Uh, yes, well, I know that they're uh, Moorcroft, aren't they? Right. Yes. Do you know any more but, than that? Um, well, there was a Moorcroft once on this program, mm. and uh, it proved to be quite valuable. But um, having looked at them now, I'm intrigued because these I thought always thought were a pair, and they obviously aren't. Yes. And one of them has the been repaired. Yeah, old damage. And there is a, a, a damage on that yeah. one, so. I mean, I assume that that's detracted from the value, so I really don't know right. if they were, what they're worth anymore. William Moorcroft um, started working for McIntyre and Company in 1898, and the first range he produced as a designer was called Florian Ware. And these are very good examples of Florian Ware. We've got the Florian Ware mark on the base, um, there the printed mark. We've got Moorcroft's signature. This doesn't mean he made them. It meant that he was the designer and he signed all the pieces that came up to the standard that he required. So he would prepare these designs on paper. They would then be applied to the vase by trained paintresses who would use the slip trailing technique, which is very like decorating a cake. Um, and that would give you the raised outline, all hand drawn, and then color would be washed in. Moorcroft was very much a, a William Morris follower at that point, and therefore these sort of designs with their flowing floral patterns are very Morris-like. And this was his great mentor. He then moved on to other things. A garniture like this is very unusual indeed because um, one gets the single vases. You quite rightly say they're not quite a pair, but that's because everyone was done differently. Everyone was done by hand. And so there were variations. This is all the same design. Yes. It's simply yes. how the design has been changed by different shapes and how um, different skilled girls decorating slightly changed it. This was an inev inevitability of the process. Pieces like this were sold by Liberties in London, and indeed much of the Florian ware was first made for Liberties and was illustrated in Liberties catalogues from about 1901 onwards. So we're dealing with a very, very stylish upmarket product. What interests me is that in the 1930s, these must have been seen as absolutely at rock bottom in terms of design, decoration, taste. You know, the, the last thing these are is Art Deco. So your mother was going out, obviously, with a good eye and buying things which at that point had no interest at all. 
Um, and the damage is old damage. We've got very nice examples of early riveting. This in itself is part of the history of the piece. It would be quite wrong to change that and get it restored professionally as you could now. Mm -hmm. If this set was perfect, oh, I wouldn't give you any change from two and a half thousand. Really? Yes. But that's that. That's for the, that's as they are. The that, three of them. Yes. It would, no, that would be perfect. Yes. Obviously. Oh yes, I'm perfect. So yeah, I yes, two and a half that, yes. to three, I think, would yes. be perfectly reasonable for a collector today because a set is so unusual. And even with the damage, you're well over a thousand, fifteen hundred, I would think, for the three, possibly more. And this came to you from an aunt, did it? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's a piece of genuine Tiffany lava glass. It's signed by Tiffany there. We can have a look at it. And uh, well, you brought me a lot of other things, which perhaps you were a bit disappointed about. They weren't worth a great deal. Well, no, we weren't built up on anything, really. Yeah, right. No. Well, I think on this one you might be a little bit surprised. It's difficult to give an exact auction figure, but it's going to be something like 1,500, 2,000 pounds. Is that surprising? Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it does. This on the, on the rim is awarded to Private H. Wilmore of the 18th Hussars. How was he a relative? Uh, uncle. What do you remember about your relative? Uh, well, he, as I said, he was in the ball. I was, I was a sergeant at the 18th Hussars. And uh, he was on his small, so they gave him the biggest horse to make him a level with the others. <laughs> uh, and then he went to Egypt. And then, latterly, he was in a pay corps in China for about 10 years. That's um, interesting in that it's got the two clasps on it for the defence of Ladysmith yeah. and also for Talana, which. Yeah. Um, raises its value quite considerably. Yeah, yeah. And the two, two of them together makes the medal worth something like about 100, 150 pounds. Add to that, and you've got a, a group then, the two of them, yeah. of 250. 250 all together? Yes, yeah. yeah. Let's see it open, there's the hidden lock. This is a strong arm bit, is it? <laughs> right, excellent. Is this something that you've inherited, or how did no, you come by it? No, my husband bought it. He bought it? Yes. Yeah. How long ago was that? 1958. Um, the story was that these things were believed to have been some of the chests that held the jewellery and the coin on board the Armada, and then they were sank off the coast of England and they were brought ashore. Nonsense. These chests were made for several hundreds of years, and in fact, before this one was made, they were in use commonly in England for at least two to three hundred years. And in fact, what they were is quite simply a secure chest. Now, these things, when they're this elaborate, you can almost date them exactly to the mid-1590s. And this one, in fact, has got a date here, 1595, which is exactly the date I'd expect. Not always do they have that. And the other thing is that Often they weren't made in this country at all. If they were made in this country, then they were usually made by foreign workmen. These wonderful locks here are usually continental. So you know how many bolts this has got on it? 13. And it is amazing that turning that key turns all these locks. Can you turn the key in the lid? We'll see if you can actually see the bolts come out. There we are. See how that from one key moves 13 bolts outwards? Absolutely wonderful. So, can I be rude and ask you, do you remember what you paid for it in yeah, 1958? 60 pounds. How much? 60 pounds. 60 pounds? Yeah. Well, it has gone up quite a lot. <laughs> but I always am a little disappointed with what these objects make when they're sold by auction. But you can't use them for very much, yeah, you know, so yeah. the demand for them is not very great. So have you any idea what it might make today? No. no. It would make between 1,000 and 1,200 pounds. So for 60 pounds, not bad. No. And you can be sure of one thing, no burglar's ever gonna get away with <laughs> no. this one. Thank you for bringing it in. It was given to my mother in the late 30s by a very old lady who lived in our village and my mother happened to be very kind to her 
and this is what she gave her. So it was a thank you. It was in her will. It was she, a thank you present. Yes, it was a thank you present. And yes. did she have any contacts with the Far East, that old lady? I'm not aware that she did, but she did have some nice Japanese bits and pieces in the house. It was well, a lovely old house. It, it is Japanese, and uh, it was made around 1900. Um, it's a brilliant example of Cloisonne technique, and you're using it for the correct purpose. It was an incense burner, yes. and you put lavender inside it. It's lavender in it, yes. Uh, there's so many different Cloisonne type techniques, but this one is using thicknesses and wire. We can go to the panel here and see that the actual design is done in very thin uh, outline, but then the actual cartouche up here is done in very thick, beaten silver wire. Wire applied to the body of the piece. So a lot of trouble has gone into the piece. Um, a lot of trouble went into the making of the knob, which is a chrysanthemum, yes. uh, a chrysanthemum about to explode. It's rather a pretty little thing. And then wonderful little panel of a ho -o bird in flight against the, what appears to be a, a snowstorm. Brilliant. It has a wooden box, which is satin-lined, that it actually... Japanese box? Yes, a wooden box, which is satin-lined. Japanese writing inside? Um, it was falling apart when I last moved keep it. it. Keep it, keep <laughs> it, keep it. But it is the original box. OK. Almost certainly made by a maker called Tadashi, one of the prime Bazzoni makers in this technique. And when you go home, uh, put it somewhere safe, and insure it for £9,000. Well, earlier today I talked to you about this Tiffany piece. We had a look at it. Uh, we've had several other uh, Tiffany type pieces in today, and nearly all of those have turned out not to be by Tiffany. But we're quite sure what this one is. Uh, I gave you a valuation of it. Uh, and uh, you remember that what, what that was? It was you? between 1500 and, and 2000. 2000. Yeah, well, we, we're yeah. going to have to revise that. Um, you probably would not find one of these for sale in England. You might have to go to America to buy one. Oh, that means. And uh, 10,000 pounds would be round about the million. <laughs> 10,000. 10,000. I'm sorry yeah. I disappointed you this morning by not giving you a proper evaluation. <laughs> Well, I don't know about breakfast at Tiffany's, but it certainly felt rather like tea time at Tiffany's here today because we've seen more examples of that beautiful coloured glass made by Tiffany's in New York in the early years of the century, more here in Accrington than I can ever remember on any other roadshow. So certainly Joseph Briggs, who we talked about at the beginning of the programme, made quite an impact on local cultural life. Next week, it's tea time in Norfolk. So until then, from all of us here in Accrington, goodbye. Hugh Scully and team will be back at the slightly earlier time of 5.15 next Sunday on BBC One. The Antiques Roadshow regrets that it cannot give any valuations by post.